Okay, everybody, we go on with the session. The next speaker is uh, Jean-Francois Gerald, and uh, he will tell us more about emotional firewalls, protecting users with unbiased personal assistance. Jean-Francois. Hi. Uh, sound is good? No mixing with uh, other sessions or anything? All right, so um, my name is Jean-Francois. Most people call me John because it's kind of difficult to pronounce my name properly, and that's fine by me. Um, I work for an organization called the OIO Foundation. Uh, we essentially work on digital rights, and that is uh, roughly human rights applied to new technologies. We're going to be discussing a couple of things, or mostly everything we'll be uh, discussing today in, in this session is not that much technical, okay? And it might, it might not be the typical topics you guys are confronted with uh, on a daily basis. That's going to come with some challenges and some friction. Let's see if we can actually go past that, because it, it is um, the role that you play in how all of this is going to be managed in the future is way bigger than you normally uh, come to think of, OK? So first, I would like to do a, um, a small test on the, on the crowd. Can programmers stand up for a second? Those who are active programmers. And let's, let's not be shy. I work on a development community, so we actually do these kind of icebreakers and whatnot. OK. Um, those who are not concerned with how their data is used by other companies, sit down. Those who don't care. They have my data, they can sell me any product, I don't care. All right, I'm going to assume those who remain do care. Um, those who are standing up, who are familiar with uh, the concept of human rights, just the concept. Those who are not, sit down. Okay, you heard about it, right? Um, who of you have ever heard about the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Those who haven't, sit down. OK. And which one of you has actually read the UDHR? <laughs> Those who haven't, sit down. OK, it's two more than what I expected. And oh, sorry, three, three. <laughs> All right? And that's kind of the elephant in, in, in the room. Um, Programmers are essential on the way you can. Uh, oh yeah, can you sit down? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Round of applause for actually. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, programmers are essential in how technology infrastructure is built. All right, a lot of people are complaining about big companies using our data, collecting data, linking, profiling, whatnot. And then in the same breath, they realize, hey, you know, I just realized with this new app that I can do, I'm going to monetize my customer's data. And they don't seem to be linking the two things. OK? You have a lot of influence on that. You're going to have the decision to make on how do you want to architect your next applications so that it respects your data and your customer's data. Now, I'm going to be trying to be get some pieces of, uh, of elements all together. And uh, through the conversation, you will see that they are actually start converging to the topic of, uh, of today, right? It may not sound uh, very, very logic, but just there's a, there's a method to my madness. Um, a few um, warnings, though. Um, I'm going to ask you to keep an open mind for the whole thing. Like I said, these are going to be topics that are not usually uh, on the table for on your daily lives. Uh, English is not my mother language, even though I'm kind of fluent, but sometimes I get stuck, so bear with me. Uh, I'm suffering a bit of jet lag from, uh, from coming up. I'm trying to get with it, so again, a bit of patience. Um, all right. What do we essentially do uh, when we are interacting with devices? Most of the time, we are trying to obtain information, right? Okay. How do we start back in the days before we had devices? Uh, obtaining information. So we had two systems. We first go, uh, started going peer to peer. We just went to the caveman next door and asked him, hey, you know where can I find deer? I'm, uh, I'm hungry, I need to go and hunt. And they would tell you this is the best uh, zone in the prairie to go and hunt. Then someone figured it out, hey, if we put all the information together in one place, then people don't have to go asking around. And we can actually centralize all the knowledge that we have as a village, as a community, and have it there as a reference. So came libraries. Now, the interesting part is libraries were designed with one specific um, uh, objective, impact. 
they were designed in a way that you as a person could go there, obtain as much information as possible, as fast as possible, and the information that you wanted. Okay? Now, moving forward, turns out that there's this cool thing called search engines. Uh, we start getting into the digital area, we have access to all of that, and we have essentially libraries who are digitalized. And uh, search engines go all around, they start crawling, uh, they start uh, indexing information, and they have their own algorithms to index that information. Now, the big difference is that those algorithms are not designed for impact. They are, they are designed to make money. And that's a big shift. And it's a shift that most of the time has been very transparent, or very, let's say, sorry, the opposite, very opaque for us. And it hasn't been um, communicated to, to users in a very upfront and honest manner. How did we start interacting with, uh, with websites? Well, we basically went to a website, so search engine, we went to a website and we started figuring out keywords, okay? And we needed to find ways to pinpoint exactly the information that we wanted uh, and try to refine uh, all of that until we found the result that we thought we were looking for. Has anyone gone in the last years ever beyond, say, Google, for instance? I'm going to assume most of you use Google. Has anyone gone past page number five of any search result? Okay, at least someone tries. All right? So imagine how all of a sudden, if you are not on page number five, essentially you don't exist. Most people don't even go to page number three, and I would bet some money here that most of us don't even go past page number one. How you are reducing the view of the world and how you are skewing that is, has a lot of dire consequences. And how the algorithm is deciding what you want to see on what they think they want to see on what they want to present to you changes a lot how it's gonna be your perception of things. All right, now enter chatbots. Has anyone been here uh, developing chatbots lately? Okay. Has anyone really th thought about what a chatbot is? I mean, I, I'm a person who doesn't really like hype words and I don't like you know, marketing and, and whatnot. The way I see it, a chatbot is a guided uh, search engine. Okay? The same way as you were before looking for keywords, all of a sudden you got a software that is providing you those keywords to search. You're tapping a certain term and then the chatbot asks you, were you referring to this or were you referring to that? And it's essentially guiding you towards a much more targeted result, which is cool. Um, I was last year uh, in this uh, low-tech hackathon in, in KL, I live in KL, uh, and it was interesting because they were trying to bring technology into law and they were providing a number of tracks and people were basically developing a number of solutions and in and around 80% of the solutions that were presented by all the teams were chatbots. And of course the question came like why? Well, because when we interact with a chatbot, we feel as if we're interacting with someone else. It feels much more natural. It's engaging a number of emotions that makes us feel much more relatable to the product. Has anyone here tried the, this uh, Uncle Bus chatbot? It's funny as hell. Uh, those who haven't, just uh, uh, look for it and have a, have a talk with him. It really interacts with you in a way that looks very natural using natural language expressions. And it's, it's engaging, okay? So it's way less cold, and I'm using my terms very, very on purpose, than a typical website. Now, yeah, my telephone is not unlocking. For a few years now, we have um, all of these companies, uh, especially Amazon, Google, um, Samsung lately, um, who have been trying to push this personal assistance, Apple with Siri, uh, uh, into our lives, okay? We kind of got accustomed uh, to it. It's interesting because um, the way we are interacting with uh, those um, uh, personal assistants, it's even more potentially engaging because well done, it feels like we're talking with a body. Now the only difference is that that body is not really your friend, okay? So 
Well, when I was mentioning before about the amount of, of pages that you have when you go for a query and you don't go beyond uh, five pages, if you say, for instance, Siri, where can I buy potatoes for my stew tonight? Do we really expect Siri to say, hold on a minute, John, I got five pages of results for you, 50 hits each one of them. Let me read one by one. You don't want that. You're expecting a much more fluid conversation, telling you there's top two options. One of the grocery downstairs, another one somewhere else, okay? That would be an optimal result for you, something that really is what you're looking for and affordable and uh, you know, available for you to resolve in five, 10 minutes because you know, no, nobody has free time, apparently. But when we are talking about these companies who are putting this uh, personal assistance which is the model that they are following? Are they following the all time library system of impact or are they following a business model trying to sell you shit? Pardon my French. The second one. And here comes the question. Can I be sure that the information that they're providing me is the one that I really want and I really need or just the one that they want to push into me? It's a very simple question. It's just not the one that they want us to, to talk about. So, uh, again, please, don't do this to me. Let's go back a little bit on how this is played out. By the looks of what I'm mentioning, it would sound like I don't like data. I actually like data, okay? Data is good. We need data to be able to make informed decisions, you know, to do plans even if sometimes that data can be very sensitive. The problem is never to have a data set, is to make it so that we cannot attach a name and a face to that data set, so that information cannot be used against someone. Mm? That's a pre basic uh, principle of uh, data protection. Uh, the typical example would be that, uh, say if I'm a government, uh, I would like to know how many people have HIV in my region. Okay, because I need to know uh, what are gonna be my contingency plan, how many uh, antivirals I'm gonna have to buy for the next uh, uh, season and, and whatnot. Now, what I don't need to know is exactly who has it because otherwise I can actually use that information against that people. In the case, for instance, of Malaysia, if you're a civil servant and you are uh, known to have a HIV, you can be kicked out. Now, I don't think this comes to any surprise to anybody of you. Any interaction that we do uh, online is essentially creating digital breadcrumbs about who we are, okay? Uh, you browse, you buy, you date, you go and watch and the biggest repository of nothing. Uh, and essentially all of that is collecting a lot of information of yours. Now a company loves to do what's called linkability which is try to figure out ways, smart ways as possible to connect all of those different separate databases and start creating profiles. Profiles that says a lot of you, not only your personal features, but most importantly, how you think, how you feel, and what are your preferences, okay? We tend to disregard all of that, but essentially what they want to know is what are your potential emotions, what are the buttons that activate those emotions and how to play those buttons. And if you think that emotions are not so important, think about right now about how you're feeling about this talk, whether it's engaging you or whether it's boring you, but that's an emotion I play. And if I knew exactly how to talk to each of one of you in the right way to engage you, bingo. I'm selling myself here, all right? At any given interaction that we have, emotions are always going to be at play. That's exactly how we are defined as people. There's no escaping that. And we have to be very aware on how is that playing out with the technology that we're using and how is that being used against us to follow a certain agenda. Whether it's commercial, whether it's political. Cambridge Analytica, anybody? Okay, and that's just the beginning. I mean, uh, I, I, I want to guess as most of you knew that Cambridge Analytica, even though we didn't know the name, did exist already. I don't think anybody who was more or less following the trends of things got, oh my God, there were some people trying to use uh, data against us in terms of changing our political views. Duh. The problem is Cambridge Analytica is not even the problem. 
they were in the, in the spotlight because it was very mediatic and, and whatnot, uh, but they are bigger companies who have much more information, not even only public information as these guys did, and we all know the, the names of these companies. They know exactly what we don't want them to know. And, and here's the funny part. So let's say, for instance, what happened uh, a, a bit back in the, in the days in, into, into marketing, which I tend to demonize. But um, if I was a guy who wanted to sell uh, vacuum cleaners, all right, I needed to have first a, a marketing pool and have a look at so marketing research and try to figure out the demographic where I can sell these particular vacuum cleaners and, the one, and try to um, manufacture the right amount to make a profit and not to you know, lose money with the manufacturing. That was a lot of money and was a lot of effort. Now we are providing them not only with the information, but actually also with the channel to reach out to us. And we're just buying them. There was this guy who, um, um, he made a, a talk on, on, on TED Talk, uh, kind of a funny talk about him pretending to follow um, one of those email scams, where the Algerian prince and whatnot. And he was just pretending and you know, replying, and it's really, really funny. I recommend you to have a look at it. And he said something very, very interesting. We got into the internet, and we thought, oh, we have access to all of this. Fantastic. What we didn't realize is that now all of that has access to us. And we were not quantifying that before. So here we are now with personal assistants that I pushed into us that talk to us directly, that we think are bodies, and that when they provide us with solutions and with answers, are we expecting that they are providing the ones that we want or the ones that they want? And so who is going to be actually being the result? Essentially, two types of, uh, uh, of answers. One, those who have a specific agenda to be there, and two, those who can pay to be there. Because when your world is reduced to this very small amount of, uh, of options, and because it's convenient, we actually just stay there, who is going to go and double check? Unfortunately, ever since we were kids, no one at school was telling us, you know, you should double check your sources. Most of us don't go through journalism training, for instance, and try to be very accurate and double check things. That's not really what happens. And think about how that affects the freedoms that I was mentioning before in UDHR, in human rights. All of a sudden, um, data is, you know, I'm giving away my data. Well, data belongs to you. And one of the principles in, uh, uh, in human rights is that you have the right for possession and to retain possession. Technology is not really providing us right now with a, a way to uh, make sure that if I request for a company to delete my data, the data is actually deleted. What we have is something much more akin to, uh, if you ever heard about GDPR, for instance? Yes? OK. What we have is much more akin as to, uh, so um, here's a brick. Please make sure that the brick follows um, the specifications. Build your building. And if it collapses, here are the laws that I'm going to use to sue you. But they're always going to go and check the, the, the building on itself. Okay? GDPR is essentially a law that allows you to sue a company if after you requesting the data, later on you discover that they did not delete the data. But the, 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 the request doesn't come attached with a team of specialists flying all the way from Brussels to whichever server anywhere in the world and make sure the, the data is actually deleted. Never mind how many times it has been copied, never, never mind how many times it has been sold to other companies. There's no such thing. And here comes the paradox. When it comes to technology, you guys know very well, you get to decide how the software works. So if you wanted to provide a technical reassurance to that, you could. Just the industry is not really supporting that. I'm not getting, I see your face of, uh, of, of doubt. I'm not saying it's, it's easy or hard. That's another story, okay? But it's a matter of will. And the moment that you perceive that there's a gain and not necessarily economical, uh, there's always a way to do it. And if the transition requires five years, then you go for five years. GDPR, in fact, was, was uh, approved in 2016, and they gave two years for, uh, for implementation until 2018. So well. Uh, 
Ah, again. Now, how does that come together to what I was mentioning before? Um, out of this concern, uh, what we identified in our organization was that the big thing that we needed to protect uh, uh, people in terms of a personal assistance, which is a good idea, I mean, it's very nice. If you think about it, a personal assistant is sort of the Pokemon evolution of what we wanted 10 years ago when we started with devices. We, had, oh, we bought this uh, very cool computer, put it at home, and thought, I want this computer to help me. I want it to do things for me, and to assist me, and to make me uh, gain time, and to provide me with uh, very cool services and, and whatnot. And I'm going to install this web server, and I'm going to be providing, you know, I'm going to install Mastodon and, and whatever. Cool, all right? And it would be even easier if you could actually re uh, remove this very clunky interface, which is a screen and a keyboard. As, a, as a itself, is a pretty slow interface. You don't really communicate with your, with your devices at the speed that you would like. I mean, here comes Elon Musk wanting to connect our, our heads with, uh, with Neuralink. Now, we see as uh, personal assistants as the potential um, uh, device that's going to do these this kind of things. But do you really want to surrender all of your capacity of, uh, of rational, rationality into those devices? So we believe that the only solution for that, and actually the, the, the big companies are pretty, uh, no one is recording this, huh? they are scared shitless about um, um, these kind of models that could, that could appear. Uh, whereby supporting open source, unbiased, non-business biased uh, personal assistance, such as uh, susie.ai, uh, would probably be a solution for this. And how you could apply to that is um, you would have a base of, uh, uh, of people using uh, this kind of, uh, of personal assistance, open source, peer reviewed, you name it, you know all the advantages already. And start using GOSI protocols by the way, uh, by which you will be obtaining information in a distributed manner. And you will be the judge of how the information is actually reaching to you. Hi. Uh, you can imagine that's not a business model that really interests big companies. And so they are doing all they can to actually push their alternatives into, into our houses. And honestly, uh, who, who wants to have Alexa listening 24 seven at home? I personally don't feel like it. Uh, if you guys want to, to think about the, the kind of unintended consequences that that can have, um, I guess some of you are familiar with uh, football and the Spanish La Liga, okay? I'm from Spain. Um, about two, three months ago, um, turns out that the official application from, uh, uh, from La Liga that people were installing in their phones, and I'm not even talking about all the way to personal assistance, just an app that you were installing. Uh, the, what, they were did, what they didn't know was that the app was activating the microphone of their phones during times of the matches to try to figure out which bars, which venues, were not paying taxes for broadcasting the matches. And of course, no one knew about that. It came as a big scandal, and of course, you know, people started uh, uninstalling and, and whatnot. But that is without you even knowing on top of that, you're going to buy a product and have it 24 hours knowingly in your, in your living room, recording almost everything you're doing, with no control whatsoever with those recordings. Yeah, you can subpoena them and you can send a request for, yeah, 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 whatever. Let's see how long it takes and let's see how much information they actually give you. Because they might not be providing you all the metadata, for instance. They can provide you with the raw data, but very likely not with the metadata. And specifically, not what they have learned from you. When they... When, uh, when Facebook came with this, can I say bullshit? I said it already, sorry. When, when Facebook came with this bullshit uh, tool about you can download all the information that, you ha that we have about you, what you can download is the raw data. Yeah, sure. But not everything they know about you. That they don't share. The type of preferences that they think that you have, the type of uh, salaries that you may have, the people you might be um, related to. None of that, what really matters, that they are not telling you. So, resuming. And uh, almost, almost done, right? Yeah, almost to the dot. When it comes to personal assistance, we don't think 
our organization don't think that the commercial ones are going to be any good. I'm not saying that they are totally evil. Most of the time, even the programmers who are involved, they are just not aware about the things that they're doing. They are not thinking long term. They're not thinking about the consequences. Uh, part of the, of the work that we do in, in the I.O. Foundation is specifically try to train programmers into human rights and digital rights so that they get to have a say and a voice in the project that they develop. But it's very, very important that we support open source uh, um, movements by which we know exactly what's the code, or at least we expose the code so peer review can be done. And we can try to avoid as many biases as possible. It always comes down to this question. Where is the line between an informed decision and an imposed decision? And it's a very difficult uh, answer to be, to be had. I personally don't have, you know, I have an opinion, but I don't have an actual answer to that. It's up to you guys to, to think about what part of responsibility you have and try to collaborate in these kind of projects and maybe try to do some good. Thank you. Francois, we have time for a question. Oh, yeah. Probably the discussion will be uh, continued tonight at the pop crawl, I assume. Can. <laughs> Questions? So one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking is um, I think one of the core ideas you're expressing is, is that being cognizant of that we should be cognizant of the potential for these apps and applications to manipulate us in ways we wouldn't be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that, I mean, all interaction with the external world could be construed as manipulation to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, insofar as when I buy into an ecosystem, I agree to be pushed and prodded in certain ways. Why should I care about the way Google does it or the way that Facebook does it, I still have free agency and I have the responsibility to be aware of the way that they're doing these things. So, mm -hmm. you know, why remove myself from that service? So th there's two elements on that uh, that I would uh, give in my answer. One, um, not everyone has had access to the same education that you do or to the same opportunities to actually grow into that education. And if you think about it, let's go a little bit away from, uh, from coding and from, from tech, all education is basically uh, a sort of indoctr indoctrination, okay? So if you don't provide the right tools for people to be able to think and to uh, exert logic and to double check facts, whichever information you have given them at birth, that's the vision of reality. They don't go beyond that. If you haven't been sparking questions, you haven't been sparking interest, curiosity, okay? And, oh yeah. Thanks. And the second part I wanted to tell you, I just forgot. Um, oh yeah, um, relation of, 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 uh, um, of cost. I was mentioning before, it took me, so if I want to be pushing a certain idea into you, okay, how effective I'm going to be is very much related to how much money I have in my bank to actually push for the idea, and how much it costs me to actually implement those things. Think about the example that I gave before about selling the vacuum cleaners, okay? I don't have enough of a picture, and specifically I don't have a direct channel to you, so I need to maximize my impact trying to talk to a variety of people with a much more broader language, okay? But all of a sudden now I have technology that allows me to talk to you, to the very much you too, because I identify that you have enough things in common. And I can create those ads on the fly with software, I don't even need a graphic designer anymore. And I don't even need to produce the product beforehand. I can print it out in 3D for you directly. So the cost for me to put, push anything that I want is ridiculous. The dangers on how much more attempts to try to manipulate and to push things that you may not really need without looking into the uh, uh, final consequences of it are just way bigger nowadays because of the cost. And of course, you need to ask yourself what kind of uh, planet you, what you want to, to live at. That's <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, um, really good talk. Uh, Thank you. Personal assistant is interesting, but if you look a few years later, when we moved to augmented reality, uh, 
Mm. We go from uh, searching data, asking a question, to actually our entire reality being pushed at us. And this device to do a good job, we have to know who you are and, and push every, like, entire layers of reality. So yeah. this whole issue is not going away. It's going to get much more important where you actually control what people see. Now, on a slightly more positive note, uh, there's another way, there is open source, as you mentioned. Um, but if you think of a product like Tinder, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Tinder, you pay for it. And they make money if they are successful in matching you with somebody you like. Because then you're going to tell all your friends and they get more customers. So the quality of, of their product need to increase for them to be successful. If Tinder was a completely free product, mm -hmm. yes, I agree with you. But uh, same thing with a personal assistant. If you pay for it, then you're going to try to find the best possible one. And this one will be motivated to find what's best for you, not what's best for you with an agenda. Of course, what they do with the data is a different discussion. So, the thing. so first is who is the owner of the data? Companies believe that they are the owners. We don't believe that's, that's the case. Can you change so that I can check? Oh, sure. Want to? Yeah. We don't believe that's always the case. Actually, never. And second, um, yes, the conversation was, or the talk was about uh, personal assistance. No, it's not the end game. Okay, the end game is actually to train programmers. I was trying to not really you know, be heavy on, on, on that, but the fact that all of these services that you are mentioning, including uh, augmented reality, are gonna be coded by programmers, um, we identify them as the, the next generation of human rights defenders because they're going to be just at the forefront of developing the apps that we are so much concerned about. There's no escaping that. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, because I think, I think we are a bit over time now. Probably not. Okay, it's working. Yeah, so uh, my question is basically about um, uh, what is this called? Regulatory uh, regulation and regulatory arbitrage because basically uh, most of what you're proposing in order to make any regu regulatory headway, you mm. need kind of a global uh, approach because all of these companies are basically uh, global companies uh, yeah. amassing uh, data from all over the world. So there's, there's two things to, to be considered. One, uh, software industry is one of the less regulated ever. And when I say less regulated, is I, I'm not aware, if anyone can correct me, of any technical regulation. As in, you know, software should be behaving, respecting these particular rights of these particular services under this particular code. And we, as uh, bodies of governance, we're endorsing this particular thing. So if you want to release software in our jurisdictions, you're going to have to be able to, make, uh, to reassure uh, that these things are done in this way, using these APIs or whatever. This might sound very crazy, but imagine what's happening in this building. For this building to be accepted, it goes through a number of regulations, and we all assume that they are done there to, be, to provide us the safety of being able to walk into the building and it's not going to crumble onto us. For some reason, software hasn't still fallen into that logic. And I can just craft any software that I want, put it out there, collect all the data that I want, and come and find me. Yeah? I don't believe so. If, if you restrict yourself into the specifics of protecting the rights of users. I'm not talking about uh, you know, uh, curtailing businesses. But the thing is, if you have businesses whose business model is based on breaking human rights, where is actually the problem? That I'm not giving them business or that they're breaking human rights? I mean, let's have this, the, the conversation there. And when it comes to business itself, um, just so you know, there's an initiative from the UN called uh, Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which has been pushed in the past year specifically to try to uh, provide this kind of approach for, for organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-François. One more.